We are streaming, hooray. Silence my phone. Yeah, I see this thing in this video and sometimes I just want to get out my scientific calculator and figure out how many times the speed of light <laughs> yeah. Our point of observation is moving here. It's called ludicrous speed, something like yeah, that. Yeah, easily. Described once easily. scientifically in a movie. Yeah, yeah we, we would put the, uh, the Millennium Falcon and the Starship Enterprise to shame here. I think it was Spaceballs. I can't remember. Yeah, Spaceballs was ludicrous speed. And, <laughs> and of course, Tesla has adopted that. Right. With the Model S Plaid. Jesus. Really? They actually call it ludicrous speed? Oh, they do good they do yeah it's uh i suppose they knew they'd get sued if they said warp factor one so yeah oh but the guys from Spaceballs won't sue them <laughs> well the guys in Spaceballs, i think mel brooks would he's gone now of course but i think uh ludicrous well, speed i think they just kind of get a chuckle out of it but and nobody's Spaceballs isn't a franchise the way star trek is it's not a live franchise. I thought I thought Mel Brooks was still around. I don't think so. I think he might now be. Now I'm going to have to now I'm going to have to check. I think he still is. Yeah, he's still around. He's American old. Actor. He's 95 years old. Holy cow. I can be forgiven, I guess, for thinking that he's not <laughs> yeah. here anymore. We probably get a phone call from him. Hey, Nin guys. Yeah. Hey, he can be on the show. Be happy to have him on the show. I'd love that. 1926. Good Lord. I triple dog dare Mel Brooks to come on our show. Absolutely. Uh -huh. And uh, we will we will enjoy talking about science fiction and space balls for an hour. That's right. Heck yeah. <laughs> and Young Frankenstein. I, I, uh, I'm hoping lots of people enjoyed Young Frankenstein. For movies. That's true. Yeah, we uh, we had a film noir film fest at our house for Halloween. Nice. It's kind of it's kind of sad. We for years and years for Halloween, I would put a telescope out on my front walk. And uh, you've probably heard this joke before. It's not a joke, it's really true. Uh, for Halloween, mm -hmm. I would have the big telescope out on the tripod and I would have a bowl of candy with uh, 15, 10, 15 pieces of candy in the bowl. And kids would come by and, uh, wow, is that a telescope? And little children would look at it and they would be afraid. And I would say, oh, would you like to see the moon? Well, if you're brave enough to look at the moon, you can have a piece of candy from the bowl down there, but you first have to look in the telescope. And they would look at it, wow, it's the moon, there's craters. Yes, you're very brave. Happy Halloween. Have a piece of candy. Older kids would come up. Dude's a telescope. Like, yeah. Is it real? Well, yeah. We kind of look through it. Sure, put a piece of candy in the bowl. And oh, so that's how you got your candy. Well, yeah. I, I, I literally would start out with no more than 15 pieces of candy on a given evening. And I would have candy all night long and a couple pieces left over when I was done. Mm -hmm. I mean, we had candy in case we needed it. But, and the kids will, well, I don't have to put a piece of candy in the bowl. I'm like, no, and you don't have to look at the cool telescope, Saturn or the moon or something cool. Hmm. And go, well, I don't believe it's real. I'm like, double your candy back. If not, if you don't really see the moon. Double your and, candy back. There you yeah, go. and the kids, the older kids would be really enthusiastic. Wow, that's so cool. That was worth a snicker bar. I'm like, yes, it was. <laughs> and, uh, you know, and I had fun with it every year. It was it was always a treat. And now, in the last so many towns, they want to get trick or treating done with before sunset, which I think is just sad. It's, I guess it's the times we live in. But uh, I had uh, I'm doing a. a <laughs> Ready for some math that counts? Count on! 
Hey guys, it's Jason Latimer, the world champion of magic, coming to you directly from my home. Now, today on Impossible Science, I'm gonna show you a mathematical effect that will allow me to read your, your mind. mind. All right, check it out. We have 16 playing cards. Now there's a relationship between all of these cards, by the way. I don't really wanna tell you what they are as far as a pattern, but there are cards that are black versus red. There are number cards versus face cards or picture cards. That's the ones with the actual pictures on it. There's also odds and evens. You get the idea. Now I want you to put your finger on any one of the number cards. That's right, any one of the number cards. Now, I want you to go ahead and take your finger, once it's over one of the number cards, you can move it to the left or to the right to your first face card. So move your finger now left or right to your first face card. Now, I want you to take your finger and move it up or down to your first number card. Up or down to your first number card. Now, I want you to move your finger diagonal to your first red card. Diagonal to your first red card. So this way or this way. Now, I want you to move down or to the left to your first number card. And keep your finger right there. All right? I don't think you're here, or here, or here. Here, here. I don't think you're here, here, or here. I think you're the two of clubs. And not only did I find your card, but you found my card. But if you want to know how to figure this out, just keep watching the video. Oh, if you don't want to learn how to do this trick, don't watch the rest of this video. Seriously. Total spoiler alert. Okay, you're still here. Okay, great. Now, in science, there's a method of how to figure things out. It's called the scientific method. Wow. Pretty nifty title you got there. They're still working on the catch your name, but scientific method is by far one of the greatest tools we've ever created. It's a process of how to figure things out. It starts <clears throat> off with observation, followed by ask a question, followed by make a hypothesis, test that hypothesis or make an experiment, make a conclusion, and then share your results. So let's just go through it. Let's apply it to a magic trick. Apply the scientific method to what we don't understand. First, observe something you wanna learn more about. All right, second, ask a question. Like in this case, how did he read my mind through the screen? Third, make a hypothesis. That means take a guess of how you think it works. Now, test that hypothesis or make an experiment. And in this case, this was designed so that you could test your hypothesis. And lastly, if your hypothesis matches your test, you can make a conclusion. If it doesn't, you have to take another guess, a new hypothesis and test that hypothesis. But once it matches up, you can make a conclusion and then you can share your results. In this case, you can share this experience to your friends. Until next time, stay curious, because the right question changes everything. Well, hello everybody, this is Scott Roberts from Explore Scientific and the Explore Alliance, and uh, you are watching the 30th How Do You Know program uh, with Dr. Daniel Barth. And uh, so, um, uh, Dr. Barth's uh, program today is that there is no debate in science. Quite right. So I'll let I'll let Daniel explain. Thanks, Scott, uh, and welcome everybody, and uh, special welcome to uh, my good friend Doug, who's joining us this week for the first time, and very delighted to have you, all of you here. And uh, we were going to do something else this week. Last week we announced we would do the hit run return. Um, model of planetary formation, but then, uh, of course, something happened, and I just said no. I have I have something that's so important. Those of you that have downloaded the book, if you uh, astronomy for educators, if you've taken a look through it, anybody who's been in class with me as a teacher 
knows that one of the things I say is that the science activity isn't just about the activity. So if we're this week in my classroom, we're doing an activity that is about gravity. And they say, well, this is sort of about gravity, but it's not entirely about gravity. And this gravity activity is about math, it's about deduction, it's about analysis. And uh, every time I train teachers how to teach science, I say, okay, there's the, what the lab's ostensibly about, but the lab should do more than that. At the end uh, result, students should learn something about science, how science works, how science moves forward. And it's kind of a cliche that we teach science as this great march of progress through time and one discovery follows another and science becomes the inevitable and the wonderful. And it's just not true. Uh, science, uh, and we've talked about this before, Scott. Uh, yes. I think Karl Popper and uh, Thomas Kuhn were right. Uh, Thomas Kuhn said the old theory dies when the last old guy teaching it dies. And the new people, <laughs> the younger guys at the university say, well, thank God old Barth is dead. Now we can teach this new stuff and he won't object anymore. And Karl Popper goes even farther than that. Karl Popper says, science is a destructive process. I tell my students, Karl Popper's idea of science is kind of like a bar fight cage match with broken bottles and baseball bats. And it's last man standing. And uh, there we've talked about the, I, the fact that there are scientists who spend careers trying to shoot down other people. And that's their claim to fame is I proved so and so was wrong. Uh, like the, the guys who tried to prove Einstein is wrong, right? Oh, all the time, all the time. Uh, and so far, uh, the king of the cage match is, is Al. Big Al, king of the cage match. Nobody's taken him down in 100 years, and, which is awesome. Um, but it's kind of like, it'll be cool. You know, this is not the last word. Uh, the science is never settled. And so I think we need to teach science as a culture. We need to teach students that science is a human endeavor, that uh, the science is never settled. And uh, basically, I think what we're doing right now is we're kind of destroying an entire, another generation of science teachers. I think the, uh, the standards-based movement beginning with it really got traction with it wasn't didn't start with George W. Bush and God bless him. I I'm not sure that he really understood what he was doing uh, in terms of education. That's not his profession. But starting with No Child Left Behind around the year 2000, we've we've kind of destroyed an entire generation of uh, science teachers and science students. Uh, we have got the same you know and people i know people right now right now watching this they're going oh i can just i can see them cringing doc what are you saying well carl sagan said extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence so i'm going to take you through this scott said to me folks when he read this he said dan sounds like kind of a rant buddy i said no 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 uh, it, it's not a rant it's a crusade uh, I'm, I'm really passionate about this so yes. uh, uh, let's go ahead and talk about it a little bit, a little bit about me. So, you know, you've gotten, those of you who are fans of the show have gotten to know me a, bit, a little bit, but maybe you don't know my background very well. You know, I'm an astronomer and an astronomy teacher and an educator, but I didn't start out as an educator. I started out my chosen career as a young man was research science. I worked and did research in immunology, Illinois State for a while. I worked on mycology in toxic fungi, fungal toxins for the USDA. Uh, and uh, I obtained a admittedly very junior research staff position working in a laboratory group at Caltech of which I was very proud. Uh, I'm, I'm a research worker at Caltech, boom. And uh, you know, uh, I have to, I'm gonna be very honest about my position on the totem pole was very low. But nevertheless, I was a very young man. It was in my early 20s. And this was, for me, it was great. But the pay sucked, guys. The pay stunk. And uh, I found it wasn't able to pay my bills working as a research scientist. And 
oddly enough, teaching offered me a 50% raise in pay. I am to this day, the only guy I know who went into education for the money. <laughs> I'm serious. I'm the only guy. And if you say, well, what kind of money are you talking about? Uh, Caltech was paying me $14,000 a year and oh. teaching first year teacher uh, would offer me $21,000. So it literally yeah. was a 50% raise. 50% uh, of nothing is nothing as they say, but it was, it was life and death to me. Um, and I felt really this was a reasonable career move. I thought I would do it for a little while and go back. Uh, 40 years later, I'm still here. <laughs> but uh, I think I found out, honestly, I'm better at education than I was at research science. Although admittedly, I didn't have as much time at research science to uh, see the full flower of my career. But I think it was a good move. And I thought being a really trained research scientist, going back to the classroom, I would bring something, I felt like I would bring something unique to it. And I sold myself that way when I was interviewing for my first jobs. What I found out going back to the classroom was something I had kind of suspected through my own high school career. Um, my teaching colleagues were people, and this is high school now, they were, high school teachers were very interested in science and many of them were very passionate about it. Um, but their skill set was not quite there. They couldn't really make the grade as research scientists. They weren't good enough at that stuff to do science at that level. And there's a few cases where this characterization would be wildly unfair. And the colleagues I'm speaking to now, the handful of people know exactly who they are and God bless you all. Uh, but for the most part, teachers that I met far and wide were people who were interested in science, but they weren't research scientists. And midway through my career, I wanted to change districts. I wanted to be closer to home. I had a new baby. And uh, so I made a move to be closer to home. And to make that move, I took a position teaching sixth grade for a year. I thought it would be awesome. I thought it would be Mr. Wizard. And it was the worst year of my career, Scott. I found out that hmm. you don't just need to know science. You need to have the people handling skills. And um, it was a disaster. Uh, and uh, I, I now have mad respect for the people who teach middle school and elementary school. Oh, yeah. At all. I have crazy respect for these people because it, it's just like somebody who juggles chainsaws. I'm like, wow, you're awesome. Really? I would I'm never try that. Maybe fourth grade up through maybe up until they become freshmen in high school. It's, yeah. It's, it's too, many, too many hormones, right? <laughs> well, you, you can argue that. But I know people who are just spectacular working with this age level. They are spectacular, and I admire them so much. Uh, but I'm not, sorry, guys, I'm not you. Um, basically, what I found in terms of science teachers being science trained is, and I know this is going to sound terrible, the lower you go, the worse it gets. The people in middle school were people who were kind of interested in science. And sometimes they were told, well, you have, true story, you have one more science class than she does, so you're now our science teacher for fifth grade. And the person goes, oh, crap, why me? Uh, they were, then you get down to elementary school. Mm -hmm. And I base this not just on people I know and I've met, but people that I train as young educators. There are people who are like, yeah, science is kind of icky, but I know I got to do it. So I, I want to have enough science so I can get my certification and then, damn it, I'm done with this. When I decided to do my PhD, my PhD, Scott, is called Teaching Science Through Literature. I wrote it for people who teach K-6 science because okay. I wanted to give them a way to do, and Astronomy for Educators is an outgrowth of that. I wanted to give these people a way to do real science, effective science at a low cost and in a way where they could learn with their students and they could go forward and they could have a blast and they could teach good science that would not teach misconceptions, that would teach real stuff and it would be hands-on and it would engage hands and minds. And you, you've all heard me on this before. Well, the other interesting thing about teaching in terms of uh, 
having an advanced degree in science, like a bachelor's or better, is teaching offers virtually nothing in terms of career advancement. If you're going to be a researcher, well, you can be promoted. If you're going to, you know, if you're doing research for a company in the private sector, you can be promoted. If you're doing research for the military, you get stripes on your sleeve. Uh, teachers get nothing. Yeah, they, there's, uh, there's no promotions. There's no increase in rank. Um, and this, the only significant reward is just for lasting longer than the next guy. And it's very modest. When I got my PhD, Scott, I got a bonus from my district. Any guess what? And uh, I'll hmm. tell you at that time, I was making about 85,000 a year. Can you okay. make a guess? Somebody making 85K a year gets a PhD in his subject. One of a handful, three or four people in a district with 30,000 students. What bonus do you give that person? 20 grand. $750 a year. Oh. 75 bucks. I was paid 10 months a year, two months unemployed. And I got a bonus of 75 bucks a month before taxes. I had enough to go out with my wife to dinner and a movie. That was my bonus for having a flipping PhD. <laughs> Obviously, it either was its own reward because it sure as hell wasn't being rewarded by the people I worked for. Uh, and I argued with that. And the union didn't even want to argue with that for me. They said, well, there's so few of you. Why should we bother? And uh, I never got my PhD. And basically, there's two ways you can go if you want to advance as a working educator. You can look at administration. For me, that was a non-starter because I would have to give up something I loved, teaching the best and brightest people, subjects that I love and delight in. Instead, I would be working as a manager. I wouldn't get to teach anymore. I would have to deal with, you know, troublemaking students and angry parents and kids who fail. And oh, right. That just, I that that doesn't that doesn't give you the fuel. So no, teachers, so teachers become teachers. It's not for a monetary reason, it is not. right? It it's is not. We're like the monks of the 21st century. We that's really right. Are. You love it is the reason why you do it. We love it. And I decided I would instead of going to administration, I would get my PhD and then pursue a university position to train teachers. And I make even less now, <laughs> significantly <laughs> less. Uh, it's like a big discount is it a penalty more. or is it uh no i, I make i don't know i make uh i took about a 30 percent cut and pay to come train educators at a university instead of teaching high school uh yeah so i am a monk thank you uh not like the kung fu kind but almost the, almost almost so basically as i as i looked around in the k6 area I didn't, I, didn't, I didn't meet anyone who had an actual science degree of any kind. They well, yeah. had taken enough any consolation. Yeah. Any consolation. Harold Locke says, you're awesome, Dr. Barth, and it would have been great to have you as a teacher. Thank you. <laughs> so you this go. is kind of like your time in my class, and I hope you're enjoying it. I'm, I'm giving you an A. So, <laughs> um, and grading is one of the worst parts of my job. It really is. But basically, we have this situation where these people, they don't have a degree. They're often teaching a subject. I, many times I saw teachers say things like, oh, and if we're all good, we can have more story time and we won't have to do science this week. And a lot of kids are like, yay. But there's a couple little kids who are just going, uh, because they love it. Um, and so we need to teach children about how science works. Kids who are up to the third grade, they love science, they have a great time with it. By the time you reach seventh grade, uh, a great majority of them don't like science anymore. And what happens? What happens? And so I wanted to make this better, but the fact is that the standards-based movement makes it worse. Um, the standards-based movement, and there's, it was, it was really based on good intentions. Let's make sure every child gets an education that includes this box of things. And that's a good intent. But there's lots of unintended consequences. Basically, problems. The standards are often developed by people who aren't professional scientists. And the professional scientists who do develop standards, very few of them have any experience teaching. And many of the professional researchers I knew hated teaching. 
my lab group leader at Caltech used to say, okay, who's going to take my lecture? Well, professor, you're now I hate that stuff. I want to be here in the lab. One of you guys has to go do my lecture today. Here's my notes. And they would basically draw sh the short straw. Got to go teach that day. And I'm like, geez, whiz, guys, this is Caltech. These, these students are awesome. Yeah. You should love to, but no. Uh, the researchers, many of them I met, couldn't teach the proverbial bear to poop in the proverbial woods and didn't like teaching at all. Uh, the other problem is uh, legislators who meddle, they get this idea that, ooh, more standards will equal a better education. Let's add to the teacher's workload. Teach more, teach more, teach more. California did this. I don't know if you remember this, Scott, back around, oh, it was just about 1990. They said, you know what would make it better? Let's make the school year three weeks longer. Do you remember that? Mm. Teach teach uh, 15 more days. Okay. Right? I don't three remember it, longer. Don't right. remember that? They nope. said, teach three weeks longer. And when did this happen? Sorry? When did this happen? I think it was like 1988 or 89. Okay. All right. And they said, we'll, we'll make the school year longer. The kids will learn more. Every child in the state booed this decision. Yeah, they, they checked out. <laughs> they, furthermore, they said, and we're not paying a teacher an extra dime for the extra work. Wow. Okay. Now, 15, 16 years later, they said, you know, we're really having trouble with meeting our budget. With this adding 15 days to the school year, that's kind of crap. We're going to compact the school year back. We're going to cut 15 days off. And guess what? They deducted 15 days pay from every teacher in the state of California. Oh, so they wouldn't give you any more for teaching more. But they but when they cut it they back, they took money away from you. you yes. Less. yes, they did. <laughs> so <laughs> the other thing, if you're going to have standards-based teaching, and to have standards-based teaching is fine, but the government wants to know the uh, both the proponents and the opponents of this idea say, well, how do we know if this is worthwhile? We need testing. We need testing to see if the kids are learning more. Well, if you're having tests, you can grade in a reasonable amount of time. It's Scantron, bubble tests, you know, multiple choice testing. And guess what? When you're doing multiple choice testing, all you can test is facts. You can't really test methodologies. You can't test comprehension of deep concepts. You can't test applications. And so there's these test scores and there's a huge amount the original No Child Left Behind Act said if a school doesn't make their target test scores, they can, they're in program improvement. And if they don't get out of program improvement in two years, the government has the right to fire half the teachers and all the administrators and take over the school district. Wow. They didn't do this very often because they understood that if we take this over, we'll be expected to make it better. And they knew they couldn't. So they really didn't do that much. But this emphasis of teach the test, we're an excellent school. Look at our test scores. I ask all my educating education students, I'm like, guys, how many of you, and I'll ask the audience, how many of you who know somebody from school who was an excellent test taker? Gosh, they just killed it on the multiple choice test day, but they needed a flashlight and a map to tie their shoes. They had less than zero social skills. They couldn't apply these concepts from the test to an actual job. And they all say, oh, yeah, I know that guy. And I said, OK, how about the contrapositive? Do you know somebody who's like maybe not so good at tests, but they're great at what they do? And, you know, they would have trouble explaining it to you, but they sure got the mad skills on the job. And they say, oh, yeah, I know I'm that guy or I know that guy. Mm -hmm. And so this idea that, gee, higher test scores means more competent students. And we know that's not true. We know that's not true. We know that the United States position on world education, you know, lists as rankings has gone down for years. And uh, we know that this big lie, better test scores means more educated students is just not so. Uh, and we realize that there's not a real life link between high test scores and success in college and career. There's just not a real solid link there. And you know how I know that's true? Scott, more and more colleges across the country are no longer accepting ACT, SAT, 
uh, GRE test scores for admission. My own university threw them out. They're not, they're not accepting these scores as suitability for admission anymore. So if you didn't finish high school, uh, don't ask me what the new criteria is. Enroll into high school? I, I'm, I'm not party to that. Nobody talks to me. Nobody asks my permission. Nobody asks my advice. <laughs> no Fools asked. that they are. <laughs> it's way the heck above my pay grade. I'm not involved in the admission process at all. Thank God I don't want to be. Uh, but basically, so Harold, Harold Locke uh, comments, he says, wow, he says, now I know why in the early 2000s, why there were busting districts for falsifying achievement records. Precisely right. Achievement records uh, are tied in with how much money you get, how much funding support you get. Absolutely. And I asked my students, I'm like, how many of you remember spending hours and hours and hours learning how to take a multiple choice test, how to find the deceptive answer and reject it. And they all raised their hand. They said, oh yes, we all did this. I said, and is this a job skill? Any of you feel like this is a job skill for you? And they all no. I'm like, okay, so you weren't doing it for you. You were doing it for the administration who answered to political masters. That's true. That's a long true. way away. Not and very said, many you know what? Ways, We've uh, lost sight in real of business. This, the, the student. Right. There's, there's one of my professors said something very brilliant. When the good of the institution is more important than the good the institution was founded to do, they're in trouble. And the standards based movement has lost sight that what we're supposed to do is raise competent adults. That's what the education process is for, to help make competent adults, not to teach them what to think, but how to think how to choose, how to analyze, how to decide, job skills. Well, the other thing, because of this can curriculum, you know, uh, you must teach the test, the sharp boys figure out how to make a dollar out of it. And the publishing companies come along and they make a pitch and they go, oh, Scott Roberts, you're a school board member at big name uh, school district in Arkansas. And guess what? We have this product. And if you buy this for $150,000, what you get is this wonderful box. Here's third grade science, fourth grade science, fifth grade science. You give it to your teacher. Everything's in there, Mr. Roberts, school board member. Everything's there. The readings, the quizzes, the activities, the analysis, the rubrics, the tests, it's all there. All your teachers have to do is deliver the content and scores will go up. And school districts buy it. I see teacher forums. We're shopping for a new curriculum this year. Anybody mm -hmm. know what works? And the teachers are asking each other, which box of curriculum will give me the high scores? And I'm like, you're lost. <laughs> you're supposed to ask, how can I teach kids so they are more educated, more competent, more successful, enjoy school, and want to learn? How do I do that? How do I engage hearts and minds? How do I set my favorite phrase? How do I set hearts of fire for science? Well, you have to pick the right what? box, Daniel. That's obvious. That's right. You have to have the right box. Astronomy for educators. Look it up on your search engine. Uh, it's not the box. It's not the box. You know, the first message the school district gives to the teacher when it hands them a box and says, oh, Scott Roberts, seventh grade science teacher, here's your box of curriculum. The very first message is, Scott, we don't trust you. Right. We don't trust your training. We don't trust your competency. We don't trust your ability to engage and motivate the students. We don't trust your understanding of the subject matter. So here, dumbass, just teach from the box. Well, of course, you know the catch-22 here, Scott, don't you? So if the scores go up, it's not you. We bought the right box. That's right. And if the scores go down, Mr. Roberts, you didn't teach from the box correctly. If you'd have done it right, the scores would go up. So it's lose-lose for you. It's another way to dock all teachers another 15 days of pay. Something like that. <laughs> and so, That's what they're getting at. <laughs> so this is the situation. This is kind of like the backstory. Sorry. Sorry, everybody. This is the backstory. But... <laughs> What set me off this last week is I see a post on social media 
and it says, hi, everybody in our wonderful teaching group. I'm looking for some debate topics for my science class. What kind of things should we debate? And my response was, um, why would you do that? Uh, there's, there's no debate in science. What are you talking about? And, uh, you know, I got flamed, Scott. You, you see social media, you know, I, I got lots and lots and lots of angry posts. I finally turned off the notification for that, that post. I'm like, no, I don't want to see any of the mad anymore. People were really mad at me. Aww. And, you know, they were like, wait, you know, of course we need to debate in science. How are they going to decide whether or not an experiment is right if they don't debate it? <laughs> Scientists the debate debate things all the time. Don't you know anything about global warming? <laughs> and they, they actually came to me and said, look here, the next generation science standard says the students must conduct an argument based on data. That's debate. And I tried to, I tried to step in here and say, you know what? Um, no, debate is when you have an opinion on an issue. We should have more ice cream served at lunchtime. And you try to persuade people to agree with your opinion. That's a debate. Uh, a scientific argument is when Galileo says, look in the damn telescope. Moons are going around Jupiter. Everything doesn't orbit the Earth. Scientists conduct a convincing argument based on data, claiming that it supports a given theory or hypothesis, and that we never say, oh, it's proven. Good scientists don't. Hallmark of fraud. This proves the hypothesis. Huh, fraud. Fraud, quack, crank, or someone who's just vociferously ignorant. A good scientist will say, well, you know, Bayer aspirin helps 96.7% of headache sufferers feel better within 30 minutes. And well, why can't we have 100%? And you saw this in the vaccine, the whole vaccine stuff. Well, yeah. I'm going to wait for a vaccine that's 100% effective. That's someone very proudly and loudly saying, I don't understand science, which means all of their teachers should be lined up and given a slap because they, they never taught this person that science doesn't work that way. Science can present a convincing argument, but to prove a hypothesis, Scott, the way we think of proof as in mathematical proof, like equilateral triangle, ge you know, geometry, trigonometry, mm -hmm. it means we would have to test every possible Bayer aspirin on every possible person and forgive me, Bayer people, I'm just, I'm not picking on you. They're all watching uh, right now. <laughs> every aspirin tablet, okay? Every aspirin tablet. It's, it's a public domain product now anymore, right? You can buy it from anybody you want to. So we would have to test every aspirin tablet made by every manufacturer on every human being throughout time, infinitum, to get, it now works on all human beings in this way. And, you know, there's a lot of things where it's just not there. They say, oh, this vaccine will, you know, 97% effective at preventing you from getting the measles or what? I'm going to pick measles. I'm not going to pick COVID. I'm not going to pick flu. <laughs> I'm just going to upset people. Let's just say measles. This vaccine is 97% or 98% effective at preventing measles for 10 years. And so you get a measles vaccine. And then 10 years later, your doctor says, you know, you're getting older, you really should have a booster. Measles as an older person is a real, it's a real pain. So, and if you go and you, if you're getting surgery, I don't care if it's, you know, cancer or tonsils out or anything, the doctor's going to say, well, you're going to be fine, I'm sure. And, you know, this treatment is 98% of effective and very few people have a side effect, right? And you see those ads, side effects may include dropsy, leprosy, your tongue falls off, uh, you know, and you realize that, no, that doesn't happen on very many people. Right. So we have this, thing where we have people asking for debate topics and I'm saying it's not a debate. You know, we have, when you talk about debate, debates about opinion, and we have a very long and glorious history of human beings deciding what theory to believe based on political, religious, personal, or profit-based motives. Right. Huge. I mean, 
you you don't have to go very far. You don't have to go very far. Um, you look at you know the famous one, Galileo and the Roman Catholic Church. The Roman Catholic Church decided Aristotle fit their theology. They said this is doctrine. Now they threw Galileo in jail. Uh, you know Einstein, relativity, 1905, 1915, Nobel Prize leaves Germany. Hitler, creep of the universe, says it's the attention-seeking rants of an insane Jew. I'm like, dude, seriously? Um, <laughs> The right. Scopes monkey trial. Uh, there is there is no evolution. And uh, Darwin never said anything about people descending from the great monkey, ages. right? Right. The Scopes monkey trial. He did. Uh, it created just, a very convincing, uh, you know, yeah. theory the Soviet, of evolution, though. You right. know? Oh, yeah. Theory of evolution is very powerful. Right. And yeah, uh, you want to read about that? The Beak of the Finch. Great book. Um, the Soviet Union, the old Soviet Union, decided that Lamarckian inheritance was the official communist theory of evolution. Lamarckian inheritance says that, Scott, if you work out and get buff, your children will be born strong. It says you can do things to your body that would be passed on as inheritance. I don't know what that says with the current tattoo craze, uh, but I have yet to see a baby come out of the womb with a tattoo. <laughs> but Lamarck said yes. Yeah. Can you see it? Like, you know, thug life coming out of the womb. I can. Oh. Actually, yeah, I can. <laughs> actually, I can. Um, so this was the official communist theory of evolution. In the 1970s, remember the Ice Age scare? Remember in the 70s, the big Ice Age scare? They said, oh, uh, pollution right. primarily from factories and automobiles is going to block out the sun and cause global cooling. Yes. There will be a yes. cuddling ice age. Right. As a, as a kid, that scared me to death. Um, and then, of course, my very favorite uh, from the Cold War era, duck and cover will save you during a nuclear attack. Oh, yeah. Did yeah, you do duck and figured. cover drills when you were? Yes. Young? Now, yes. Of course, I lived on military bases. And, sure you uh, did. And so we had we had real military guys who were who understood what a nu nuclear blast would do to people. OK, so um, he said he did say that even under the worst circumstances, even at, on a direct hit, that some people would actually survive it. Yes. And we had a meeting, the kids in the neighborhood had this meeting afterwards, and we decided <laughs> that we did not want any chance of surviving uh, I'm going to go uh, out and watch in. the flash. We want, yeah, we wanted to be standing outside watching it coming in. <laughs> um, yeah, I remember. That is a death wish, but we didn't want to have to try to survive uh, the the aftermath, you know. So it was exactly, and, and that's, of course, military bases. That's that is ground well, zero. That's not so. uncommon. I remember one of my older brothers telling me, you know, the only good place to be in a nuclear attack is ground zero. Sure, right. Um, so. All of these theories, Scott, and, you know, we're, we're a little bit too young, but in our parents' generation, uh, mothers were told to take up smoking because it lowers birth weight. It makes for an easier pregnancy. <laughs> that's, that was real medical science. Yeah, that's marketing run amok. Or, or it check is. See if your child's getting enough sugar in their diet, you know, so. Oh, yeah. Right. Well, what you what you have there is you have a theory which is being adopted and promulgated based on various social, political, profit motives. Sure, that was that <clears throat> religious motives, sugar versus fat uh, argument. You know, the the American scientists said it was sugar, and right. you know, this is all based off of uh, off of um, I forget which president had a heart attack. Um, but there was a scientific study paid for. Uh, I think it was Eisenhower. Eisen it was Eisenhower. Okay, so they they hired some students, I think from Harvard or Yale, one of the Ivy League, and they did a study, and much of it was paid by the American Sugar Council or something like that. So sure. uh, fat became the culprit. 
So you remember all the fat free stuff that came out? Oh, yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. Consequently, uh, European scientists did the same study and they found out that sugar, sugar is, was the culprit. culprit. So, you know, how that weighed out amongst and the world. The Greeks were right. Moderation in all things, right? Epicurious, right. Right. moderation in all things. I, I want to read I want to read a comment here, which I think oh. is important. Um, uh, uh, Christy White, um, uh, Libby and the Stars uh, uh, lectures on Global Star Party often, and Christy is the is her mother, and she said that Libby asked her the other day if teachers really think that kids believe them when teachers tell them that they're they're the worst students they've had in twenty years. <laughs> she said, "I explained to Libby that says more about them and not." <laughs> adapting to be a teacher to today's kids and learning. Absolutely. Lives. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, you never say that kind of stuff to a child. Yeah. You know, if, abuse. That's it's basically crazy. putting your failure on them. Right. I, I think almost every child can be excited and motivated and engaged in the classroom. Yeah. Uh, yes. When I fail to do that, I fail. You know, I fail first. I fail before you do. I, something I, I often told students, um, and I stopped saying that because it got misinterpreted and misquoted a lot, but I still, I still think that as a teacher, I fail before my students do hmm. uh, in almost every case. Now, that's not universally true. There are kids who just say, I'm not going to, I'm not showing up, I'm not doing your homework, I'm not taking your tests. I've had students spit on Scantrons and hand them back to me without filling them out. Uh, and so in that case, yeah, I don't know. Um, my fault. I think there's a lot of baggage coming in there. <laughs> but basically, let's go ahead and take it back from current events a notch. When I teach this, how do we decide about a theory in my classes? I use Copernicus and Aristotle. For one thing, uh, this controversy was settled 400 years ago. Nobody gets worked up about it anymore. Not even the flat earth people get worked up about is the earth in the center or is the sun in the center? Uh, so nobody gets worked up about this anymore, which allows me to separate the emotional content from the scientific content. And because when I, when I talk about a topic that excites someone's personal, political, religious passions, as students, the profit motive isn't really there very much, but personal, political, and uh, religious are then their ability to be dispassionate and discuss science like goes grounds to zero really quickly. So I talk about Aristotle and Copernicus. And of course, we know Aristotle was not the first person to say the earth is in the center. He's the best known and wrote the most about it. Copernicus is certainly not the first person to talk about the sun's in the center. He is simply uh, the one who resurrected the theory and addressed it most cogently. And um, basically, the other thing is that one of these theories is fundamentally incorrect and the other is not. But the question is, how do we decide? And what I've found is that when teachers of astronomy and physics touch on this at all, often the tack they take was, well, people used to believe in the Earth was in the center and this was really dumb. Ha ha. They didn't know better is something I, I heard a lot. And it's, it's absolutely a nasty smear on Aristotle and company. I used to prank my students, Scott. I used to come in hmm. and wrap a, a sheet around myself as a toga and say, hi, I'm Aristotle. I'm your sub for the day. And I would proceed to teach the earth is fixed. It doesn't revolve. It doesn't rotate around anything. It's the center of the cosmos and the sun, the moon, planets and the stars all revolve around us. Have you seen those memes where the guy says, you know, the earth is really this, it says, here's a statement, prove me wrong, a guy with a cup of coffee on a, and a sitting behind a coffee table. And I would basically come in and say, well, who's, who's taught you these silly things that the earth moves, the earth revolves? What nonsense? Come outside, let's look, the sun goes around us. And not one student, not in 40 years, not one student ever successfully argued and convinced anyone that the Aristotelian theory was wrong. They weren't, Not they didn't one. have the mad skills to do this. Mm. And I said, and they would be like, but wait, we've all been taught that the earth revolves around the sun. 
this can't be true. Why are you doing this to us? And the punchline inevitably delivered the next day because I would stick to it. And I would get angry notes from parents. Kids were mad. Administrators were mad. The math teachers were all pissed. And I would come in the next day and I would say, you know what we learned last yesterday? The Earth-centered theory is not stupid. It's just wrong. These theories, Scott, were the lifetime work of the very best minds of their generation. Mm. They may have been wrong, but they weren't maliciously wrong. And they weren't stupid by any means. They were just incorrect. And so the question then becomes, OK, if you couldn't prove to me that the Earth really moves, then how do we decide between two competing theories? How do we do this? How does science do this as a culture? as an activity how do we decide between theory a theory b you know mm. global warming has been going on for years global warming is caused by human activity how do we decide between these two activities uh, the earth is flat the earth is round how do we decide between two theories well in one case it's not too hard we have photos and nasa and esa <laughs> but uh, there are there are real theories where somebody says oh no this is this is what causes lung cancer and this is what causes the fat and sugar Right? What causes heart disease? Right. And so basically, I first thing I teach my students is that if a theory has no testable hypotheses, it's not a theory. It's just rambling. A theory has to be able to produce testable hypotheses, something you can test. And sometimes you have theories you realize for centuries there was no test to tell you whether Copernicus or Aristotle was right. This was the case for these two theories coexisted for 2000 years. And the smartest guy arguably in the ancient world, Aristotle came down very heavily on the earth centered system. But frankly, there was no test to decide between them. And so they were concepts, ideas, theories, maybe, but there was, there was no test. And sometimes we don't have the tech. Sometimes we don't have the money. Sometimes we don't even know what we would possibly need to try this out. Big Bang Theory. How would you test it, Scott? What technology would you need to test Big Bang? And for a long time, it was like, uh, I don't know. We came up with cosmic background radiation and, yeah, Penzias right. and Wilson and all those guys. But right. um, basically, there's, there's basically three steps. The first right. step in disproving a theory is when the theory predicts or fails to predict something you do see. And, oh, look, there's another particle physics famous for this, right? Oh, crap, there's another particle. For 50, 50 years or so, people would go into uh, the cyclotron, the accelerators, the particle chambers. Oh, crap, there's another particle. And so the old theory didn't predict what we see. Well, you know what? This is a this is a kind of the weakest level of flaw. It indicates that, oh, gee, we need something. We need to adjust our theory because we've got something here that we didn't predict. And that's kind of that's interesting. That's that's exciting to scientists uh, in any theory and in any discipline that they wow, we found something new. That's very yeah. exciting. Uh, but then there's, you know, and we talk about how did that happen? Gee, retrograde motion of planets. Aristotle knew about it, couldn't explain it. It went unexplained for 500 years or more until around 200 AD, Ptolemy said, oh, we can have epicycles. And uh, I can go ahead and share a screen here and show everybody some stuff. Uh, this is from, here's our epicycles, and I'm sure most of us are familiar. The Earth is in the middle. There's a crystalline sphere, and then there's another sphere, and one rolls along the other. This is like the old spirograph toy, Scott. Right. And so, uh, oh, so we adjusted our theory, and now we can explain how epicycles work. And epicycles continued to be the cutting-edge science for another 1,300 years, more than a what millennia. Was, what was supposed to be at the center of the epicycle? Uh, it's just a point. It's like a glass ball. Oh, and okay. it's just the center, we would call it the center of gravity, but it's sure. just basically said the one glass ball rolls across the top of the other. They, they pictured it as one glass ball rolling across the surface of another. I see. Okay. 
Uh, and so kind of explains the motion, but it does. It explains the motion, but it's it's a may happen, not a must happen. Right. The problem with Ptolemy's idea is that you had to tweak the size of the circles and the speed to get it to match what you saw. And you were constantly having to adjust the theory to account for facts. A good theory produces things that must happen and precise measurements because math, because physics, but this wasn't quite so well understood at 200 AD. The second mode of failure, Scott, is when a theory predicts things you don't see. So not failing to predict something you do see, but it predicts things this should be there and it's not. Example of this right now is what they call the sterile neutrino. There are theories which say there should be a sterile neutrino. It's tied in with the dark matter idea. You can look up sterile neutrino. And sterile neutrinos, by the way, are all right-handed. The neutrinos we all know and love from the sun and nuclear reactions are left-handed. And so oh, they say, well, there should be a right-handed neutrino and it should be a sterile neutrino. And it kind of looks like a dark matter particle, but you know what? Nobody's been able to find one. So the theory predicts something and we don't see it. Now, sometimes this happens. Theory predicted the neutron 30 years before Chadwick discovered it. Sometimes we just need to look harder or we need better equipment. But again, this is a slightly stronger mode of failure. You're predicting something and we don't see it there. Uh, when we talk about the phases of Venus, nobody in the, Helios, in the geocentric crowd ever predicted phases of Venus. But if you take a look at the diagram here, here's the uh, geocentric diagram. From the Earth, you should absolutely be able to see phases of Venus. You should be able to see the quarter phases. You should be able to see the full phase. You shouldn't be able to see the new phase because you're staring at the sun, which is bad. Don't do that. Uh, and so nobody in Copernicus's time thought of planets as anything other than a wandering star. They didn't think of them as worlds as places until Galileo saw Jupiter was a disk in his telescope. So, but the general theory of the Earth-centered universe says, yeah, we should be able to see phases. And it says we should be able to see full Venus, but we don't, we can't, we never do. And so, mm, that's a problem. It indicates a serious flaw. It says we're making factually false predictions. Mm -hmm. Now our theory is really rocked and reeling. It's not unrecoverable. Particle theory just kept being resurrected like Frankenstein in a bad sci-fi flick. But uh, there's a third failure state. The third failure state, Scott, is when the theory posits that something we do see is actually impossible and can't be there. Uh. The classic one of this the Earth-centered people said nothing, everything goes around the Earth. Galileo took his telescope to the roof of a building and invited various merchants and dignitaries and cardinals and bishops of the church to look. And Cardinal, I believe it was Bernardo Gui, uh, looked through and saw moons around Jupiter and that Jupiter was a planet, a place, a world. And he rose from the telescope and Galileo's like, ah, uh, ah, uh, ah, uh, great, yeah. Uh. And the Cardinal said, I don't believe it. <laughs> just that, just straight right. up. I and so basically when your theory says something you do see is impossible. So what's impossible? Well, we look at the way Venus looks through a telescope. Galileo discovered this between 1609 and 1610. And oh gee, Venus when it's in a crescent phase is really big, five times bigger than when it's in a gibbous phase. And we never see full and we never see new. And Galileo's just looking and documenting what he sees. And he's like, wow, this is crazy because the crescent phase is the brightest phase. The dimmest phase is when it's almost full, which is exactly opposite to the moon. The crescent moon is the dimmest phase. The full moon is the brightest phase, which we all know. But mm -hmm. Venus works differently. It works backwards. And if you look at, ooh, here's this sun-centered model. Venus is inferior, closer to the sun than us. The distance between us and the crescent phase is five times less 
than the distance between us and the nearly full fix. Hmm. It's five times closer at crescent time, which means it's five times bigger and it's 25 times brighter because the inverse square law. So it's tremendously brighter at crescent phase than near full. And this theory says, oh, here's why you can't see new or full, because in both cases, you're staring at the sun. In one case, full Venus is behind the sun. You can't see it there. The other case, new Venus is in front of the sun, and the glare prevents you from seeing it there. And so this is a not a maybe situation. This is a must-be situation. The new theory, the Copernican theory, the sun centered theory, says, yes, Venus must have phases. New and full are impossible to see. The crescent must be larger. And the nearly full disk must be significantly smaller. The old theory, guess what? Venus is never any distant or closer to the Earth at one time than another. The distance between Earth and Venus in the old theory never changes. Remember, hmm. Aristotle believed in perfect circles. So did Copernicus, by the way. So in a perfect circle with Earth in the middle, Venus is never any farther away. This is exactly like the moon, whose orbit is as close enough to a circle as most people will never need to bother with. But here we see that, oh, Venus changes its distance by a factor of five. Venus is about 0.7, about three quarters of an AU, 0.72 for you sticklers out there. And so if this is a quarter of an AU, then this is two and a quarter. It changes by a factor of five. Mm. And so we're not trying to tweak the theory anymore to preserve the appearances. The theory dictates precisely what appearances should be, how long each phase should take, what days we should be able to see Venus in crescent, in quarter, in gibbous, near full. It says, oh, going from crescent to quarter is fairly quick, but going from quarter to near full takes a lot more time because it takes a lot more of the orbit. And it predicts all these things and it says, must be, not maybe by adjusting the size of your epicycle or the speed at which it rotates, but these must be true. And so, we see that Aristotle's model fails on many fronts. And interestingly enough, the Copernican model says these things must be true. And in fact, when we observe the things it says we must see, we do see. The things it says we may not see, we cannot see. Hmm. And the timing is easily predicted. The appearance is easily predicted. <clears throat> but this whole thing. And we did this. Uh, how do you prove the heliocentric theory correct? This was episode three. And how do you know? Mm -hmm. You know, when we do this activity, Scott, it proves Aristotle's wrong, but it doesn't prove Copernicus is right. It strongly suggests Copernicus is right. It raises our confidence to the 90% plus level, but it doesn't prove it. We would have to watch the solar system forever to prove it. I mean, we get close enough where we can say, yeah, you know, either, either God's really playing with our heads or this is true. Because we now we can now say, yeah, the, the heliocentric solar system, 99.999999. But does yeah. that mean that all solar systems are heliocentric? No. Could you have a supermassive planet and a super tiny dwarf star that orbited around it? Possibly. Yeah. 100% proved? No. Overwhelming confidence? Yeah. Right. So you have to remember what the people in Galileo's time believed had no meaning. If you took a poll at that time in 1609, 99.995% of scientists believe that the Earth is the center of the cosmos. You know what? The whole damn world was wrong and Copernicus and Galileo were right. The polls were irrelevant. The opinions don't matter. The beliefs don't matter. The science is never settled. All oh, the science is settled. Quake, fact, you know, fraud, crank. 
We're constantly there, seeing new discoveries that disprove. There is, there is no debate in science. There's only data. Facts aren't really debatable. If they're honestly measured and, and oh yeah, the Sugar Institute and the, the Butter Institute in Europe, yeah. Were they, were they cherry picking their data? Were they messing around with? Yes, of course they were. Of course they were. Does this make their data valid? No. But when you have facts that are demonstrable, everybody can test them and see that they're true, there's no debate about the facts. Now, we may argue that these facts support theory A more than theory B. We may, like Galileo, be forced to recant, repent, and go to jail. At Percy Murve, that's what he said when he rose from his knees and he was forced to say, the earth neither moves nor rotates. It is fixed in the center of the cosmos. Copernicus was a heretic bastard, and I'm so sorry I ever believed him or taught him or discussed him. I was wrong. Please forgive me. And he rose from his knees and muttered, it per se move, eh? and yet it moves. My data supports this, not that. This was an argument, but it wasn't a debate. The Catholics at the time the church was debating, they dug up a former... Uh, colleague of, uh, they, they arrested a colleague of, of Galileo. The guy's name was Magnus. And they said, you're, you're a supporter of Copernicus and you need to recant. Magnus would not. And they took him in and they imprisoned him. And they asked him to recant. Magnus would not. They showed him the instrument of torture. We're going to pinch, pinch you with this. We're going to cut you with that. We're going to burn you with this. Magnus said nothing. He would not recant. They put him on trial for his life and convicted him of heresy. He would not recant. They chained him upside down to a pole and piled his books around him and threatened him with the torch and said, for your soul, Magnus, recant. He said nothing because he had been dead for 15 years and they dug him up out of the ground to try him for heresy, to convince Galileo that there was no length they would not go to, that we are the original gangsters, and no matter what happens, you will be condemned to hell forever. Repent, repent, repent. They were hardcore. Hmm. And folks, we have, there's a whole lot of, of good stuff for reading. If you want to read more about that, uh, Galileo Heretic, and I have links for all of these in the, in the thing. Uh, Copernicus's Secret. This is uh, Jack Repacek how the scientific revolution began, Copernicus in Modern Astronomy by Angus Armitage, uh, A More Perfect Heaven, How Copernicus Revolutionized the Cosmos, First There's Copernican yeah. by uh, Joachim Redicus, and uh, one of my favorites, The Earth Moves, at Corsi Muve, Galileo and the Inquisition by Dan Hofstadter. So there's a whole... There's a whole set of uh, reading for uh, the viewers out there. I hope you found this to be more of a persuasive argument than a debate. I'm hoping that everybody found it was a great episode. I know we we're a little off topic this week. We kind of veered into uh, the philosophic and uh, I dare say the religious and the political. We skimmed the surface. Hopefully we avoided crashing into any of those things. And uh, I hope you will be an activist, friends, when you talk to your local teachers. And, uh, you know, we need to educate teachers. We need to train parents to look at science and teach how science works. And scientific activities should not just teach about gravity or cells. They should teach us something about science and how it works and how we decide. This sort of thing tells young people how to think, not what to think, because who knows what theory will come next? I don't know. I have, my crystal ball is cracked. Sorry, my Ouija board. I'm trying to get a refund from Parker Brothers. It doesn't work. Uh, 
but I can tell you that there will with confidence. I don't know what theory will come next, but there will be a theory. And we may be called upon uh, to decide, you know, sugar or fat. <laughs> and we need to understand how this process works and how to look at the data. And we need to know that there's never any final answer. There's always going to be uncertainty. And we need to teach children to be okay with that and to continue to look at right. science and data with an open mind That's rather right. than one which is closed and shuttered by personal, religious, political, or financial motives. Uh, so I'm hoping everybody found this a, a worthwhile show. Were there any other cool comments or uh, questions from the... Uh, Actually, several. I mean, the people, I think, in general understand uh, that there are, you know, political motives and money motives and just, you know, people want to interject an opinion on what they think that a particular theory might hold, okay, or, or what it might prove. Um, and there are probably to this very day people that look at things and go, Okay, I see it, but I don't believe it. Indeed. Okay. So, right? Indeed, that Even when was not the last, and certainly not the first, and absolutely not the last. Not the last, and will no. and there'll always be more after him. So, or quantum right, mechanics. Them. Feynman said, "If you say you understand it, you're a liar, uh, and if you say you know you believe it, you're nuts, and yet you have to accept it." Uh, so there are lots of theories which challenge what we think, how we think, our place in the universe. Uh, there are lots of them, but we need to teach students how science works and how scientific decisions are made, rather than encouraging them to join one or the other side of a debate. We need to teach uh, people, everyone, young and old, how science works, how science decides which, uh, one of the things I told my students about, um, and you can see this every summer, hurricane tracks, hurricane predictions, right? Uh, hurricanes are, a big hurricane is coming uh, for Europe, for, uh, for the United States, wherever a typhoon is coming for uh, the Japans or China or Indonesia. And we look at, we look at the weather channel, we have relatives in Florida, so we anxiously watch the weather channel. And we see, oh, well, this model predicts the hurricane will go up the east coast of Florida. This one says the west coast of Florida. This one says it goes up the west coast for a while and veers off into the Gulf. Oh, if this one says it goes right up the middle, this one says it goes, bounces off the east coast and then re-impacts at Georgia. And we see all these tracks and somebody says, oh, I win, I win. I predicted the hurricane would go right up the center and look, that's what it did. And then if you look at the same model for the next hurricane, it doesn't do such a good job. The fact that we have each hurricane prediction track is a theory. Then we get the data. Are any of these theories valid? It's not, I win, I guessed right. You, you didn't pick the right duck at the carnival that it's said- Almost like the multiple choice. Right? What <laughs> yeah, happened- Lucky. Yeah, theory is not legitimate unless it predicts continuously, successfully, routinely, unless it demonstrates a broader application. Unless it says, oh, and you know what? Here's where my theory fails. Here's where the next new great discovery is coming from. Here's the place you could you should focus your efforts, All right? Sterile neutrinos. Mm -hmm. Ooh, you know what my theory doesn't predict? Sterile neutrinos. You know what? You guys should really see if you can actually find one. You should look here because the theory, here's a crack. Go investigate. Good theories do all these things. But we have this march of science model that we tell children and adults grow up believing and it's just not so it's it's much more of a free-for-all than that yeah right well great well hopefully that gave our audience some things to uh consider and i hope you think about it. when they I think about theories and how they apply in the world of science so indeed Right. I'm hoping you enjoyed it too. Uh, I did. I did. I, I am totally, you know, uh, in your camp about this because as an outreach, someone who does outreach, uh, mm -hmm. when you, um, 
start talking about some of the uh, current thought, okay, in science, um, you do encounter people that have want to throw in, interject their opinion, okay, on on top of it, you know, and and there are people that have their own uh, ideas about how the universe works, um, which is you know not not uh, something that you should just uh, lightly throw away no. and say, no, I'm only going to hold on to this one theory. That's not how science works either. Okay. My, my typical comment for that is show me some data that supports that. Yeah. Right. That, and I, I'm, you know, well, you well do you this, have is, any this is data my opinion. I'm that. like, yeah, that's great. But do you have, do you have some data that supports that? Uh, right. And if it's, if it's a real thing, then you know what? People in many lands, many languages, regardless of their culture or beliefs or politics or religion, they should all find the same thing. Gravity works the same way for everybody. You trip, you fall down, you go boom. <laughs> you know what? It's, 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 easy, knows that one. it's easy to say, oh, here's something and I'm going to drop it and I'm going to measure the acceleration, uh, tin of hand cream. But, you know, you should be able to, you should be able to say, show me some data that supports that. And that's, that's where you kind of quickly separate the cranks from the legitimate thinkers. Flat earth people start offering excuses. Uh, well, what about this? And they offer excuses. Well, NASA faked that photo is a classic one, of course. Uh, and they're, they're not able to show you data that supports their idea. The one guy, and I feel very bad for him, that the guy in California who made the steam powered rocket to go up and prove the earth oh, was yeah. flat. And he, he crashed and he himself. died. Yeah. He, and he died I, I felt very him. bad for him. But at the same time, oh. he was trying to gather unbiased data in support of his theory. And he was willing to die for it. He was right. He's in the same club with Galileo. I'm gathering data to support my theory and I will die on that hill. And you know, sometimes we're wrong. Percival Roll was wrong about canals on Mars. Right. Galileo and Copernicus were wrong about perfect circles. Uh, and, and it's rare to find, well, it's, it's never been done. There's no theory that's right across the board. There's always problems with it. Right. There's always deficiencies. There's always, as Carl Sagan said, there are wonderful things waiting to be discovered. And you know what? There's not a single damn theory that predicts them all. Right. And a theory should tell us where to go and investigate, but pure research, like let's land on Mars and see what the rocks are made of with a rover. That's badass. That's awesome. That's fundamental research. Because you know what? Theories be damned. We're going to go gather some data. Before we went to the moon, we tried to answer the question, how is it formed? And you know what? Until we had data, it was all speculation. I wouldn't call it a theory at all. Yeah. Now you found them in textbooks. Learned people would propound them or discuss them. But until we went and gathered some data, it was all speculation. And speculation is fine, but it should be identified as such. Well, this sure. is my idea. I haven't tested this, but this is my idea. I think if we looked here, we'd find that. That makes a speculation and hypothesis. Fine, great, terrific. But go give me some damn data. And until you do, you know, your speculation is, you know, that and four bucks will get you a cup of Java at a Starbucks. You know, until you design an experiment that gathers some data, it's not scientific yet. It may be fascinating to discuss over beer and pretzels. Not a theory yet. Right. Mm. Okay. Next week, really, okay. really, the big impact theory is being revised <laughs> and it's becoming hit, run, and return which just sounds like a Roger Corman Fast and Furious episode, but yeah. we'll come back next week. Uh, promise uh, Scout's Honor that we will indeed have hit, run, and return uh, the evolution of the big impact theory. Great. All right. Well, Daniel, thank you very much for another fascinating episode. Uh, make sure that you download the study guide for this. Please do. Um, 
And uh, make sure you download uh, the book, Astronomy for Educators, as well. Please. The link is on the post. And um, we'll any, be back any search week. engine, if you put in Astronomy for Educators, comma, Daniel Barth, it will come up. It will and, come up. And you'll be able, uh, over 6,500 uh, schools are using it worldwide wow. now. We're serving about uh, three to 400,000 students each oh. year now. Daniel, do you remember what it was when we started this program? Uh, it was below 2000. Great. Okay. And I have it, I have it in a log somewhere, but yeah, um, we've, we've tripled the circulation and, uh, I do, I post a lot, uh, to social media and I get my account locked regularly because I get something interesting and I'm posting and I'm posting and I'm posting and then oh, oh your posting. account is locked. You're post somebody, some bot <laughs> is said, posting that too much. Yeah. Uh, because I'm, I'm a member of about, you know, 50 or 60, uh, various uh, science teaching uh, groups Proof. of various stripes right. and yeah. persuasions of, from many countries. And uh, Facebook, I have to change my password all the time because Facebook freaks out. I, I posted, if you go to the Astronomy for Educators page, there's a, there's a great uh, little video on uh, teaching about gravity. And uh, my students, I, I post this video, my students go, yay! Uh, watching uh, a marble roll up and down a ramp, mm -hmm. and uh, with this uh, with this activity, and it's in the Astronomy for Educators book. Guess what? You can teach calculus to fourth graders. You can show them right with an experiment and data that velocity always increases, but gravity, the acceleration of gravity, is constant at all times. In any case, folks, we'll, we're a bit over time, so we'll wrap it up. And thank you, everybody. Scott, I'm going to log off. Folks, it's been grand, and you can reach me at any time, astronomyforeducators at gmail.com, and we'll see you next week. Bye-bye now. Okay. All right. So we will uh, be back. Uh, I won't be back tomorrow. I'm taking the day off, folks, but uh, uh, we'll be back on Wednesday. And then Thursday, we have uh, Global Star Party happening again. It'll be our 71st. So thanks very much. And uh, you guys have a great evening and keep looking up. Bye, everybody. Thank you.